So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We've got a truly global audience with us today, which is fitting because we've run a global fellowship round this year. Our fellows, as you will know momentarily, have joined us remotely due to the prevailing coronavirus crisis, but have risen to the challenge of connecting to both the center and our partners over the past two months and digging into some truly complex challenges. I will give a brief introduction to the fellows program, introduce you to our fellows, and then the primary focus today is really hearing from each of them about their projects and the work that they've done, as well as some of their insights and recommendations for the center and our community of partners around the world, working with data to solve problems in humanitarian action. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Stuart Campo, and I have the privilege of managing the data fellows program every year. This is the fourth year that we've run the program, and every year, we're continuing to be impressed by the way that external experts manage to bring in new insights to the problems that we're trying to solve here at the center and farther afield, uh, both as OCHA and as a broader humanitarian community, looking at how we can apply data to improve the delivery of humanitarian assistance to populations in crisis. Hopefully, as I introduce, there we go. Our four fellows, you'll be able to see them on the screen. So I'll do uh, clockwise from what might be your top left, starting with Kasha. So Kasha Chmielinski is one of our two strategic communications fellows. They're joining us today from New Jersey in the United States, and we'll be speaking to you about how they've gone into different dimensions of trust and how we communicate trust and data on HDX. To Kasha's right, I believe, on your screen should be Roberto Roca, joining us from Palermo, Italy today. Roberta has been the predictive analytics fellow in this year's class, and will be sharing her insights on how complex systems modeling might help humanitarians better understand and respond to need in different crisis settings. Below Roberta here on your screen is Julia Janicki, joining us from Paris, France, where she has been the data journalism fellow, and she'll be speaking today about the brilliant data story that she's developed working with a number of OCHA offices in the Sahel to help communicate about the urgency and need to take action on the climate crisis. And to Julia's left or right, depending on the orientation of your screen, is Murray Garrard, joining us from Colorado in the United States. Murray is the other strategic communications fellow, and Murray has been working on a topic near and dear to my heart, communicating about data responsibility in humanitarian action. So the run of show today will be a series of back-to-back -back Ignite presentations by each of the fellows, followed by an interactive Q&A with all of you. We encourage you to drop questions into the chat throughout the fellows' presentations, but please note that we will not be taking time between the presentations to answer those questions. We'll compile them during the course of the discussion and then have an open dialogue for the second half of this program showcase. We will also have a chance to hear some of the fellows' reflections and recommendations more broadly on how their areas of expertise can help us solve different problems in the sector and also let them give us some thoughts on what we might do next with this data fellows program. So with that, I'm going to first hand over the floor to Julia to tell us about the great work she's done on her data story about the climate crisis in the Sahel. Julia, over to you. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Okay, I'm Julia Janicki. I'm the Data Journalism Fellow this year, and I'm going to present uh, what I've been working on uh, this year on the data story, which is on the climate crisis in the Sahel. I'm a conservation biologist by training. I've also been trained in remote sensing and spatial analysis. I got into communication because I wanted to present my thesis to a broader audience outside of academia. And that's also how I got into data viz. And I've been working as a freelance data viz designer and developer and a freelance data journalist over the last couple of years. I grew up in Taiwan in the US and I lived in Japan for a long time. And now I live in France with my husband. Uh, I became interested in the Data Fellows Program because um, I wanted to learn more about the humanitarian field and contribute to it. And at the same time, I wanted to learn more, gain more experience in data journalism. So data journalism is a relatively new field and depending on who you ask, there's different definitions, but overall, due to the increase in volume and use of data in recent years, Data-driven insights have become key components in uh, some journalistic pieces. That, along with storytelling techniques, a more compelling story can be told to catalyze action. 
uh, in the context of the fellowship, what could be some added values of a data story? First is for the target audience, including donors, uh, policymakers, or the general public. Uh, a data story can provide a more immersive means for them to better understand a topic from the human perspective while being backed up by data-driven evidence. Second is for the uh, center and OCHA. The data story can support the center's vision by communicating from a humanitarian perspective uh, while incorporating the human dimension. This can hopefully lead to donations, attitude change, or policy change. The first thing I had to come up with when I started the project is a problem statement in order to help guide the project. Uh, and um, the, the topic of the data story this year is on climate change in the Sahel. How it affects the most vulnerable and also the humanitarian system. And even though I'm using Chad as a more specific case study, I, it covers six countries in the Sahel. And it's a very important topic because in 2018, there were already 108 million people in need of assistance due to climate change. And that number could nearly double by 2050. And the funding uh, gap has also been increasing. So here is my approach. First, in order to better understand the context, I read many reports from humanitarian organizations such as OCHA, IDM, uh, IDMC, and IFRC. Then I interviewed humanitarians in the data and um, communication fields. This included uh, the OCHA field offices, the uh, Senegal and Chad country offices, and the communication office. I then started looking for relevant data sets using HDX as well as sources from reports. Then I cleaned and explored the data sets using R and observable notebook to look for data driven insights. Then I looked for um, stories in order to incorporate the human dimension. And once, once I got a story and uh, data driven insights, I started developing the narrative as well as uh, prototypes. And both of these are very iterative in that throughout the whole process, I got feedback from my colleagues. And once a narrative is more or less finalized, I started the development along with a colleague uh, at the center who's developed the previous year's data stories. So here is the main narrative that I came up with. Uh, it's basically an abstracted story of a girl's daily journey to fetch water in Chad. And each step along her way, she sees something in the landscape that reflects a um, climate-linked problem in Chad or more generally in the Sahel. I focus on Chad because I had to pick a place for the journey, but at the same time, Chad is also among the most impoverished and climate-vulnerable countries. Though all of these uh, problems are experienced by all six Sahelian countries. And here is a specific step of her journey. Uh, it serves as an example of what she sees and the problem it reflects. Uh, she passes by some herders whose traditional migration routes have been disrupted by climate change. And the shorter rainfalls have also forced them to be on the move uh, for longer and also move south earlier, often before the crops can be harvested. This may sometimes lead to the crops being trampled and potentially leading to intercommunal conflict. So this section is focused more on the human dimension as it explores how the girl and her community are uh, experiencing problems related to climate change. This next section is focused on data-driven insights, uh, and it's actually parallel to the main narrative section. So for each step, the user has the option to look at data visualizations on the six Sahelian countries. I set it up this way, so if the user wants to just uh, read over the whole main narrative without disrupt, uh, disruption, they're able to do so, but they also have the option to dig deeper if they want. So some recommendations if you want to work on a data story. First is before working on a narrative, I think it's really important to talk to domain experts to get their perspective. And while working on the narrative, it's important to get uh, iterative feedback from both the audience and the, um, and the experts. And the second is it's important to create a human emotional connection for the audience by incorporating the human dimension, but at the same time, uh, backed by data-driven data insights. 
And finally, um, as we tend to have shorter attention, attention span these days, I think it's a good idea to keep the main narrative relatively short, um, but uh, have options for the user to see more if they want to. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Julia, thank you so much and really strong note to get us started on. Um, just a couple quick process notes for the audience. You can use either the chat or the Q&A function to send questions in. We do see a few of the questions coming in through the chat, so thank you for those. Um, one question was about whether the slides from the fellows' presentations could be made available, and in past years we have done that along with the publication of their blogs and the recording from this event, so we can make sure to make the slides available so that you can dig into what Julia has just shared and what you'll see in the other three presentations. Please excuse the siren in the background. Someone's in trouble. So with that, Julia, thank you so much. We're going to hand right over to Roberta to keep us moving through the initial part of the session. Roberta, I know you're having slight connectivity issues, but we will make sure that it works. And if not, we'll circle back to you. But over to you to tell us about the exploration you've done into complex systems modeling in humanitarian settings. Everyone, can you all see my screen? And oh, nope, sorry. Hear my voice too? Yes. Okay. Five, five, five. Right. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Roberta Rocca, and I'm the Predict Analytics Data Fellow for the summer. Uh, the focus of my project has been to explore opportunities to use complex system modeling in the humanitarian sector as a tool to both uh, better understand humanitarian crises, but also to uh, support humanitarian response. Um, as Stuart was mentioning today, I'm speaking for, from a very hot Palermo in southern Italy, um, the town where I grew up, uh, but I normally live between Austin, Texas, and Aarhus in Denmark, uh, where I work as a postdoc in a field called uh, psychoinformatics. Um, the broad uh, focus area of my project is that of predictive analytics, uh, for which, as you might know, the Center for Humanitarian Data has recently started a specific work stream. And predictive analytics is a field that aims at supporting humanitarian action through a number of analytical tools that make it possible to anticipate events rather than merely reacting to them, thus making humanitarian response quicker and uh, more effective. Um, within this broader area, my focus, my project focuses on a specific problem. Namely, the fact that the methods that we currently use to estimate humanitarian needs um, tend to allow us to only look at needs as, in a way, snapshots of humanitarian crises, or in a way, they allow us to look at needs in a static way. Um, so, needs assessment generally produce estimates of what the scale and type of need in a specific area is, uh, but these estimates tend to remain roughly the same for the year following the assessment. The problem is that in many humanitarian crises, um, needs fluctuate quite dramatically over the year, um, often as a result of like the complex interactions between multiple factors that underlie these crises. Um, and this is the case for crises such as um, those related to food security, for example, but also it's the same for like seasonal crises such as both. So we see the same type of dynamic fluctuations, um, but it is also the case for like crises that are more familiar to us, such as epidemics. Um, in order to respond to these crises, we need to understand how these fluctuations come about and to learn to uh, project how these crises evolve over time so that we can identify the optimal points for uh, humanitarian intervention. So the, pro the focus of the project was really to find out which methods can we use to do that and to explore specific opportunities to pilot the use of these methods in the humanitarian sector. So to answer these questions, I conducted a number of interviews with both technical actors, so modelers mainly, and with actors close to humanitarian response uh, and operations. And I, I reviewed existing technical literature and modeling and existing models. And I interacted with the predictive analytics team at the center to build on their current work and expertise. And interviews especially converged in revealing a strong demand for tools that more natively and more intuitively in a way support projecting possible scenarios and that on top of that maybe could make it possible to anticipate the effect of different types of humanitarian interventions. Um, and this led me to recommend uh, the predictive analytics team to focus on a modeling technique that's called system dynamics uh, for an initial pilot of com complex system modeling in the, in the humanitarian sector. But what is a system dynamics model and how does that work? Um, 
the slide I'm showing may um, make it look like a very complex thing, which it actually is, but the idea behind it is actually pretty simple. So a system dynamics model is basically a graph that represents how um, multiple factors in a system interact with each other to give rise to specific uh, phenomena. So the one you see here, for example, is a representation of a model for a scenario that, as I was mentioning, has become rather familiar to all of us, namely that of the dynamics of an epidemic disease. Um, as you may know, this is a topic which is not new to the center. Uh, the center has already conducted some work on modeling COVID in collaboration with uh, Johns Hopkins University. And the outcome of that work is a model called Ochabaki model, which is not the one I'm showing here, but it's available online in case you're interested in looking at work the, the center has already been, done, uh, been doing. Uh, but as, as you can see in this slide, the model represents a number of variables or quantities that range from epidemiological parameters, such as the fatality rate. And this is what you can see in the bottom right of the, uh, of the model. Uh, but also variables that quantify the interventions that uh, are put in place to um, to stop or to limit the spread of the epidemic, such as social distancing measures. And this is what you can see in the top uh, center of the of the screen. Uh, and the arrows show how these variables influence each other. So the model is provided with this information, which comes from domain experts, basically, uh, but also with information on what the delays are at which these variables affect each other. So basically, how late can you see the effect of one variable on the other? So a model like this uh, can project day by day with the kind of information it has. It can project day by day how many cases and how many recoveries and deaths there are uh, in an epidemic. Uh, but it also makes it possible to visualize things like how, this, how do things change if one changes some parameters in the models, such as the strength of the, inter of the interventions. And this is the parameters that you can see in the bottom uh, right of the screen. So as you can see here, um, let's assume that we change intervention parameters and make them as strict as possible. Changing these parameters also change the incidence of the disease quite dramatically. So this is an example of how these tools can be used to by policymakers in a way. And these tools could also be adapted to the humanitarian sector to test, for example, the impact of responses before implementing them. So to identify the type and timing of response that produce the best possible outcomes. So most the most desired outcomes without producing unintended side effects. So in the first part of the project, I identified a number of problem spaces uh, that I also identified a number of problem spaces that may be suitable for a pilot uh, that would use system dynamics. And these problem spaces included, for example, modeling food security or trying to increase resilience to natural catastrophe, uh, catastrophes. Um, but among those, the most promising one for first pilots seemed to be the idea of developing a color response simulator um, supporting impact, impact assessment for color response plans. And there were two main reasons for that. One is that this kind of model can have potentially very high impact on um, many humanitarian contexts where a color is, is still present. But the other one is that this kind of uh, work could integrate very well with other ongoing efforts to control uh, to control cholera. Uh, so the second part of the project focused on reviewing resources and data for this specific specific problem space, um, and the outcomes of this work will also be made public at the end of the uh, of the fellowship as an appendix to the final report. Uh, there are a number of concrete next steps for this project. Um, some of them include strengthening partnerships and involving people who are interested in collaborating with uh, system modeling work, um, because this kind of um, this kind of work really requires gathering as much uh, domain expertise and technical expertise as possible. Um, other uh, future steps uh, involve strengthening collaborations, especially with the development sector, where these techniques are already widely used. Um, and also trying to bridge a, the technical gap or a literacy gap uh, by organizing initiatives that promote awareness of these techniques and that make these techniques easy to understand for uh, humanitarian actors. So if these ideas speak to you and you want to learn more or get engaged, uh, stay tuned for the final report and for all the developments that will follow. Thank you all for your attention and thank you to all of those who contributed actively to this project. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Roberta. And uh, I think a through line already that's coming out of the first two presentations is how the fellows have been grappling with complexity. Julia grappling with communicating a complex crisis in the Sahel. Roberta grappling with how to model complexity. And I never trust someone who works in uh, cyber informatics when they say it's simple. <laughs> I can tell you she was clear and made it simple, but she's been doing some really complex analytical work. So, Roberta, thank you so much for sharing that.
moving to another aspect of complexity in terms of how we communicate what can be quite dense ideas in the data responsibility space elegantly and in a way that gains traction, we'll hand over to Murray to talk about his work on communicating data responsibility. Murray, over to you. Hey, there we go. Okay, so go tell it on the mountain, doing data right. Hi, I'm Murray. I'm one of this year's Strategic Communications Fellows. Um, my background is in journalism, and I've been working in humanitarian commun humanitarian communications for close to um, 10 years. Now, I grew up in the UK, and I'm currently based between Boulder, Colorado, which is where I am now, and Palm Springs, California. And, and one of the things that Boulder and Palm Springs have in common is that they're both in close proximity to mountains. And I like mountains. I like them a lot, and I like to live near them. I love to climb up them. And honestly, I find mountains to be a source of inspiration for a lot of my work. Um, and here, these are just uh, some of the mountains that I've spent time on in recent years. And, and we're gonna come back to mountains a little later, but first uh, let's talk um, strategic communications. So what is strategic communications? Um, strategic communication is designed to persuade audiences with a goal of increasing knowledge, changing attitudes or inducing desired behavior. So at its heart, strategic communication is the art of influence and the means by which one persuades my area of work for the center was data responsibility. The working draft of the OCHA responsibility guidelines, which are here in the center, was published in, nine, uh, in March uh, 2019. And since then, the center has been supporting those integrating them on the ground. Yet there remains a sense that though data responsibility is an increasingly acknowledged as an important aspect of, humanitarian, of eth uh, ethical humanitarian action, a widespread understanding of how it can be operationalized has yet to stick. So here was my problem statement that I worked from. OCHA field staff need fewer barriers and greater incentives to integrate the OCHA data responsibility guidelines in their work. And in order to fully grasp this problem, I needed to do two things. I needed to understand data responsibility myself, and I needed to get to know the audience. So after a crash course in data responsibility, I spoke to a range of OCHA staff based in diverse field locations. And from this, I was able to identify three key barriers to the integration of the guidelines. Firstly, was the issue of accessibility. OCHA field staff are overwhelmed with information and have little time to read. Um, the guidelines were often perceived as dense, understanding them felt time consuming and data responsibility felt technical and complex. Secondly, was the issue of proximity. Now in the field, the Center for Humanitarian Data felt far away. Those working in data often felt isolated, not least because data responsibility had been siloed into a single function or even in a single person within an office. And thirdly, and related to this, was the issue of responsibility. Who was fundamentally responsible for data responsibility? Now, because everyone in OCHA works with data, those that I spoke to were eager to point out that data responsibility was everyone's responsibility and should be considered as such. And these conversations determined the direction of my communication strategy. It became clear that the strategy had not one, but two core audiences, those working in the field with data on the ground and senior uh, staff in headquarter locations who determined organizational priorities and had the power and the authority to influence the uptake of the guidelines. And here is where we turn back to mountains. So um, given the potential complexity in data responsibility, I designed my messaging hierarchically in order that audiences typically would encounter the simplest messages first, after which they'd be drawn into messaging of greater complexity as their understanding of the subject matter grew. So if you like my summit message, the first they would be they would likely encounter was do data right. Now it doesn't tell you everything that you need to know about data responsibility, but it does suggest that there's a right way to do data and it's a message that can be easily understood. Halfway down the mountain, somewhere perhaps near the snow line, sits my secondary message set. These were messages that articulated why data responsibility is important and why they should continue to engage. And then at the base of the mountain, I positioned messages that related more to the technical aspects of the guidance, how to do data responsibility. So the strategy itself was designed across three pillars, what I came to call the three A's of communicating about data responsibility, accessibility, amplification and advocacy. Now, the pillar of accessibility was designed to develop more and better entry points into the guide guidelines. So to this end, I prototyped a series of physical and digital assets that summarize key actions and, and distill the guidance into something easier to digest. The second pillar, amplification, looked at the vehicles by which those assets could be effectively 
delivered to target audiences. Now, in this, there were three sort of subcomponents. The first was a data responsibility care package to be sent to all OCHA field offices containing items that would make data responsibility physically present in their work. Second, there was a plan for a global community of practice, a data responsibility network. Um, to build, uh, uh, and thirdly, um, I developed a digital campaign that coalesced around do data right. And the third pillar of my strategy was advocacy. And here I developed a plan that targeted OCHA senior management to drive a broad interest in and understanding of data responsibility among those in OCHA with the ability to influence the mainstreaming of data responsibility across the entire OCHA ecosystem. So after this, what are my recommendations to the centre and more broadly to the humanitarian system? And yeah, we're gonna build this around mountains. So first up, be brief, think summits. In our overloaded information environment, we can only really see the peak of things. So don't tell your audience everything you want to tell them, just tell them enough to entice them to engage. Start with a slogan, a headline or a hashtag and then build complexity from there. Secondly, be bold. Only the tallest mountain is visible in a range. So make your communications visual, repeatable and shareable. The most successful communication campaigns are those that punch the highest above the communications noise. And thirdly, be broad. A single mountain is often comprised of many interconnected peaks. It's hard, they're, they're hard to isolate and sort of define. And this is how I often think about audiences in the information age. All audiences are embedded in interconnected networks and messaging is not merely broadcast, but it's co-created, reimagined and amplified far beyond those for whom it was uh, originally intended. So design messages, not just for your audience, but for an entire ecosystem. Know your audience and speak directly to them, but also know that you don't know your audience and that your message can find reception and gain traction among audiences you never knew you had. And that folks is all I have. This is a picture of me on the summit of Mount Tupacol. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs> Thanks so much, Murray. And I think that speaks uh, somewhat directly to the setting we find ourselves in today in this virtual showcase. We have over 125 people in the audience around the world, many of whom are anonymous squares behind a typewritten name. So I think you're all connecting with certainly people you've engaged with throughout your projects, but also audiences that you weren't aware you had. That's really the purpose of this showcase. We want you all in the audience to ask questions. We have a few great questions already in the chat. After we move to Kasha's presentation, we will then move into the second part of the showcase where we will discuss in more detail different aspects of the fellows projects as they presented them and also hear their feedback on the program as a whole and recommendations for the center and our partners on how we can apply their different areas of expertise to the problems that we're trying to solve. So please keep the questions coming and uh, be ready to engage. With that, Kasha, I will hand over to you to round out this first portion of the showcase and share what you found about communicating trust on HDX. Great, uh, thank you so much. And can you all see my screen? Yes. Fantastic, all right, so my name is Kasha Shmielinski. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. I, For my project, I dug into trust, quality, and community on the Humanitarian Data Exchange, which is the platform that the center has created and maintains uh, for the sharing of, of data. So jumping straight in, um, my background is slightly technical, but right after that, I actually went into industry. So I've worked in big and small companies uh, in academia and government, and more recently as the lead of a, a research project around ethical data. And when I say I'm a product manager, people usually look at me like I'm crazy or I have 10 heads. They have no idea what that means. Uh, and so the way that I like to explain it is to uh, tell you a bit about the kinds of questions that I think about. Um, so it's things like, how do you build bipartisan technology in a very polarized political environment? Um, how do you scale an open platform when you have zero or very few resources? And how do you actually address large intractable issues like ethics in a way where you can actually deliver things? So um, you kind of summarize that by saying that I like to think about systems and complex problems and then find actual solutions that can move the needle forward. Now, key to all of this is how to communicate. And for my project, I've been thinking a lot about um, communicating systems of trust and what that means on a platform where you're sharing data, especially when you're trying to enable the rapid sharing of high quality data sets. Um, so diving right in, I am framing this up with a quote from Lao Tzu, which is a, who's an ancient Chinese philosopher. So shout out to my mom for helping me translate this. It's actually very difficult to translate ancient texts. Um, I think he was onto something here. Uh, and he basically is saying that trust is reciprocal. So one who does not trust others is also not going to be trusted. And that's kind of a, the core of what I'm going to talk about today. 
So to step back for a second, for those who are not familiar with the Humanitarian Data Exchange, this is a platform that was created by the center in 2014 to help find, share, and use humanitarian data all in one place. There's tens of thousands of data sets and um, millions, uh, millions of downloads <laughs> have, have happened over the last seven years. Um, it's really the core place where people go to find and exchange this data. Now the problem space that I was looking at is really the intersection of these three different actors. So you have organizations, which are data sharing entities. So I think that overlaps with some of the broader definitions of organization, but it might be even larger than that definition. Um, those are organizations that are putting data onto the site and they are really trying to understand what the quality standards are. You have the HDX team and they're confirming that quality and they're actually hosting all that data. And then you have the user that's coming to the site to find the data and they wanna understand what it is that they're looking for and how then they can use that data once they find it. So in terms of how I approach this question of um, data quality and trust across these three different actors is a combination of quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis. So I'm gonna kind of breeze through it because we don't have too much time. Um, but from the perspective of the data users, I looked at web analytics data on the left-hand side and emails on the right-hand side. And what I saw here was uh, that, first of all, there's a very high conversion rate. This is the people who come to the site who look for something and actually end up downloading something. This is higher than I've seen in many parts of industry. Um, and what I see here is that people know what they want and they can find it. But on the right-hand side, the kinds of qualitative questions we're getting, um, uh, let me know if, you're, if I'm having issues with the audio quality. Uh, I'll keep going. Okay. The uh, uh, kinds of questions are, you know, how do I actually use and understand this data? From the organization side, I took a look at some internal data and did some analysis here. What I saw as a narrative is that it's a pretty steady onboarding of new organizations to the site year on year. However, there's definitely a notion of super users. So the top 25% of organizations on the site are actually providing 96% of the data. So that's, you have this cohort of folks who are really providing a lot of data and then others that are providing less. And when you look at who these organizations are, they tend towards the, uh, the older organizations on the site. So you might think that someone who's been on the site for a long time would eventually tail off. That's kind of the opposite of what you see. And finally, I took a look at those who are actually not publishing a lot of data. And I found that on the orange bar there, 15% of organizations never publish a single data set. And if you wanna mitigate that issue, I looked at when people were publishing their first data set, you really have a six month window to engage before the chance that they're going to publish data drops to zero. And finally, I did a lot of interviews with the HDX team and um, learned a lot about the QA process, which is extensive. I think the takeaway there is that the process itself will not scale as the project scales because they're spending a lot of time on most things. And really, I think in the future, there's an opportunity to spend more time on really important elements of QA, like whether there's sensitive data or personal data and less time on things that have been reviewed before or are less likely to be dangerous. So in terms of the proposal and the recommendations, you know, what we heard is basically just to, just to summarize, people can find things, but they want to understand how to use them. And we also have a number of super user organizations that are publishing a lot of data. And at the same time, as things scale, the QA team might not be able to keep up with that demand. So what can we do to start to federate trust um, to support a growing platform and make sure that we're prioritizing quality? So um, the proposal is to have a trusted status across two different vectors, one for organizations and the other for contributors. And just like the Lao Tzu quote in the beginning, this has to be mutually beneficial. So you have to look at the benefit to the user, which is around certification, having kind of a, an advocacy status in the community, access to different resources, uh, and maybe an expedited QA process for the organization or the contributor. And the benefit to HDX, of course, is that there's agreed upon minimum quality standards. And so we can kind of assume that anyone who's in this program is going to be adhering to those standards. It provides a great opportunity um, for others to understand what would be expected of them if they want to become trusted. And it also helps us build this middle tier of community of volunteers who will help us maintain the quality on the site. Um, finally, I did a quick analysis based on some draft criteria to what these premier or trusted organizations would look like. And it's seeming like you go from about 100% of organizations down to about 20. So one in five would currently match the criteria. And that feels like probably the right amount of um, right amount of percentage in terms of how easy or hard it is to get that status. So the recommendations that I would leave the center with are along these four different questions. You know, we need to first define what the benefits of the status are. So understand the features, figure out eligibility, so that's criteria, 
um, program management in terms of guidelines and the team. And then what do you do next? You know, an actual defined roadmap so this can become a reality. So that's the end of my presentation. I also just wanted to thank um, all the folks who took a lot of time over the last eight weeks to speak with me. Uh, this would not have happened without you. So thanks very much. Awesome, Kasha, thank you so much. I think it's a really great point to end this initial portion of the showcase on bringing us back to our core as the center really around HDX and the data that all of our partners share every day to help increase the use and impact of data in the sector. Without this core of our work, we wouldn't be able to do all of the other interesting things that the other fellows have spoken about. So this really gives you a great snapshot of the different areas of work that the center is engaged in and some of the problems that we're trying to solve. So as a reminder, we're now moving into the more interactive portion of the program. There are already a few questions that I've noted down and we'll start with those, but feel free to continue sending questions either through the chat or the Q&A window. Hopefully you can see one or both of those. We will do our best to address as many questions as we can in the roughly 25 minutes we have left. And just to say again, both the recording and the presentations will be shared along with some reflection blogs from the fellows likely out in September so that you can learn more about their brilliant projects. So to begin, we'll come back uh, sort of following the order that we took in the presentations and come first, Julia, to you. There's a question about the human element in your data story, which of course is a really important aspect of what you've developed and how we can improve the way that humanitarian organizations balance qualitative information, for example, from community engagement with more traditional quantitative data from assessments and other sources. Could you speak a bit about how you approach that and how organizations might do that more broadly? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, so I guess it really depends on the medium you're working with. So for example, if it's a report, then it's most likely it's going to be a bit more qualitative, uh, quantitative, I mean, so more data driven insights. Uh, but then in order to balance that, for example, you could maybe when you're sharing it on social media, you could share it with like, a photo of some people in order to create an emotional connection, maybe with um, a one sentence summary or maybe adding a quote. Or if you feel like your work has been more predominantly quantitative, um, you can maybe try working on a data story or a photo story that focuses a bit more on the, trying to create a human, uh, a more emotional connection uh, by incorporating the human dimension using either maybe a narrative, uh, including a character, for example, um, that people can connect with, or maybe some photos, um, some something more visual. Um, so that's uh, my recommendation. Great, and I don't want to, to spoil the surprise of the data story when you all get to see it once it is released, but Julia has very deliberately embedded a navigation aspect where you can sort of move between the narrative qualitative and the more quantitative data-driven insights that she's developed over the summer so that users can digest the story in the way that they want to and access the information that resonates most with them because communicating about climate change is certainly a challenging topic that requires both. Julia, thanks so much for that. R Roberta, we'll come next to you. There's a question here about how the modeling for cholera outbreaks might be field tested to understand how well this could actually predict outcomes. What information should those responding to an outbreak be collecting to allow these models to be evaluated and improved, getting at a critical aspect that if we don't have the data in the first place, we will struggle to model what might happen. Roberta, over to you. Thanks, Stuart, and thank you for the excellent question, um, which also matches well some of the challenges we um, we had during the, the fellowship and trying to develop the pilot. Um, there's there's two sort of, I see there's like two different questions here. One is how do we actually validate the model? And in speaking to that, the model needs to be validated on historical data, basically. So we try to build a model that pretends it doesn't know what happened in the past and tries to predict what, what, what actually happened. So that's the way the model needs to be validated. In terms of the data you need to do that, there's different sources of data. And I'll mention mainly two. Uh, one is the epidemiological data themselves. So how many cases have there been? How many deaths? And the closer or, or the better the temporal resolution of those data. So the more fine grained the information on when the cases actually started, and um, 
So, and how many deaths there have been at which point and where this is a very rich and very important uh, for a source of information to validate them all, uh, which is, I know, um, it can be a, a challenge in humanitarian contexts. Um, one of the things that can be practically done to improve that is, for example, improving the speed of detection of cases, right? So the earlier we detect the cases, the more accurate the temporal information is. But then there's a second source of data, especially if you're thinking about testing, testing a model that um, tries to um, simulate response effectiveness. In that case, intervention data are crucial and they are very hard to find at the moment. So um, trying to collect very uh, accurate data on which types of interventions have been uh, put in place, maybe categorizing interventions into different types of so prevention, monitoring, and different sources of information is very important. But yeah, collecting data on which interventions have been um, put in place and where is really crucial to validate the response part of them all. Uh, because if we don't have information about what actually happened, what kind of response has been put in place in the past, it's going to be impossible to um, to test basically the main thing we want to test, right? So what's the best strategy? How has it worked? And what should we do in the future? So um, sharing information about what has been done, when and where uh, is really the um, main, um, main challenge and the key point here. Thanks so much, Roberta. And of course, there will be uh, an aspect of your report and some of the final outputs that speak more to the specific concept of modeling public systems dynamics around cholera. So colleagues who are interested in learning more will be able to do that in the coming weeks. Next, Murray, we'll turn to you. There's an important mountain recommendation that came in from the audience. It's a recommendation, maybe even an invitation to climb a mountain <laughs> in Tajikistan. So that's a nice... Uh, Next thing to do post fellowship to detox, <laughs> but 1st, 2 other more pointed questions about your project. So we have 1 question about the possible creation of a data responsibility network, which you mentioned and whether there is funding for activities around this and some of the other aspects of your strategy, or if it was all bootstrapped. And then a related question from another member of the audience mentioning that for NGOs uh, working closely with data in a fast paced environment. It's not always possible to allocate human and time resources to tackle all of the aspects of data responsibility. So how might advocating for the importance of this work help address that challenge? And what other thoughts might you have um, for organizations trying to advance data responsibility in their work? And we can't hear you, Murray. Sorry, you might be. Can you hear me now? Now we can. Yay. Yes. Okay. Idris, sorry about that. Idris, thank you so much for the um, recommendation. A lot of my family live in Kazakhstan, so I know Tajikistan fairly well. So um, never made it to the Pamirs, but but plan to. Um, in terms of uh, the, the 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 ideas in the in the communication strategy being bootstrapped to any particular funding source, actually, um, no. It was it was I, I had the benefit of of working sort of um, with an unlimited budget, if you like. Um, so. Uh, what, what I created was a, a kind of grab bag for the center to take forward and and to maybe cost up. So 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 there was no kind of um, uh, necessarily funding implications uh, or, or or funding restrictions to to, to the the um, the elements of the strategy. However, part of the reason that the um, the, the data responsibility network is I think important is that. You know, there's, so, there's such an issue of trust, and this is really what Kasia was talking about. Um, community, we we we. Um, we um, believe people um, that we trust and therefore creating a network of, of, of like minded people um, and, and, and building a community, I think, is one of the, the, the best ways to communicate um, across an organization and, and, and infuse a sense of trust within those communications. Um, Daisy's question, Daisy, that's a really great question. And, you know, um, data, the, the impact of data responsibility is invisible until it isn't. Um, and, you know, when we're during the course of this fellowship, there was an occasion when there was an agency uh, that, that there was uh, an agency who who had um, uh, whose whose use of data was being questioned quite strongly in the media. I come from a background of uh, you know accountability to affected populations, and my the the way in which accountability to or AAP has been sort of embedded in the sector was both through mainstreaming it and um, uh, through through sort of 
through organizations, but also through a lot of external pressures. So I think when data responsibility becomes an issue in the media, when it sort of becomes a scandal as AAP and, and PSEA have become, um, then, then I think organizations will often start taking it more seriously. So I think there's a kind of dual effort. One is to build sort of confidence and understanding of data responsibility within organizations, within OCHA, within NGOs, but also know that the, the, some of these external pressures when data responsibility isn't adhered to, when data goes wrong, that's when um, often people will pick up um, uh, ideas around data responsibility and, and and start working on it. So I think there's a, a, a dual process. My communication strategy really was just Rocha, so it didn't really speak to that. But um, but I, I see this this as a kind of um, um, a movement sort of um, this is probably how this 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 area will evolve. Thanks so much for that, Murray. And, and maybe just to put my other hat on at the center very quickly to say that is indeed how the data responsibility movement, if we can call it that, is uh, is shaping up in the sector. Uh, we're working with a number of different organizations to tackle this issue collectively because it is a collective action problem. And you can learn more about this work on the center's site and feel free to reach out to us if you want to connect and see how we can work together. Next, Kasha, there are a few questions for you, one in the Q&A and one in the chat, so I will summarize them and then hand over to you to respond. So there's a question from uh, Jessica Libertini saying that you, it seems like in your presentation you were suggesting that it would be good to have those who downloaded data also add data, but she would imagine that there are some organizations who access the data, academics, those in food security, environmental security, et cetera, who wouldn't have raw data to add. Did you parse this in your analysis? So that's the first question. And then a question from Yumi about sort of the implementation of the concept of trusted status. So do you envision that the trusted org and contributor program is something that HDX would curate and grant or that the criteria to be trusted is transparent to users in terms of the requirements that they work toward in order to have this status? Great, can you hear me okay? All right, awesome. Uh, those are great questions. So to Jessica's question about um, the two different users, it's actually, I'm really glad you brought that up because it's really important to distinguish between those two user types. So in my analysis, one was a data organization. Those are the folks who are providing the data. And then the data user is the person who is actually downloading the data. And to your point, they may be the same, but they also may be very different. Uh, and so in my analysis, I mostly focused, it on, focused on the organizations uh, and the overlap I think that you're talking about is maybe between the criteria of publishing and downloads. And when I say downloads, I mean, how many times are those organizations data sets downloaded? So kind of like what's the impact that they have when it comes to how often their data is being used by others. But I actually tried to distinguish between the two. And on the user side, I did dig into um, some analysis there too, uh, like I showed in the slide. And I found that to your point, there's kind of different buckets of users there. There's humanitarians, folks in academia or students, you have private sector, you've got government. And um, honestly, the data got pretty noisy because of COVID. So because of some of the data that's on the site relating to COVID, actually um, the user types kind of shifted um, over the last year. So it was kind of tough to, to cancel that noise. Uh, but what I did do is I took a sample of all of the contact us emails and I coded them like by hand. So I took like, uh, I don't know, it was like 25 or 50 emails and I coded them for things that were coming up a lot. And that's when it you know, became obvious that uh, data dictionaries and update frequency and these kinds of things are really important to users. So although they might be the same, I actually analyzed them separately. So that's a great question. Um, I actually heard that the team, the HDX team, uh, just put in place a survey. So hopefully they'll be getting even better data about folks who are downloading, and I look forward to hearing what they find. <laughs> so it had nothing to do with me, but that was pretty cool when I found out they were doing that. Uh, and then to Yumi's question about the implementation, um, also a really good question. So if I understand what you're asking correctly, uh, you're asking about how transparent this um, this program will be, and then whether this is something that's granted from HDX or just kind of earned. And the way that I'm thinking about this is less as a transaction and more of kind of a relationship and a community building exercise. So it's kind of, um, let me think of an analogy, it's like less of a video game level where you're like, ding, 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 you got it, right? And more of like a membership to like, a, I love data club, right? So the criteria is open, um, but it may require, you know, one of the criteria might be that you actually have to engage with the HDX team or that you have to go to a training. 
right? You have to actually get a certification from the team that you have learned about data responsibility and that you've taken some kind of a, not maybe not an exam, but you've like sat in on some kind of a training or an onboarding. So it'd be something in between, but I also do think that transparency is important because otherwise it's just like, you know, HDX is just kind of deciding and that doesn't feel very fair. I think it doesn't build a good community. So I hope I answered both those questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kasha. And just keeping an eye on the clock, I'm just going to mention that you've already either sort of presciently or inadvertently answered another question that came in while you were talking from uh, Laura Jennard about whether HDX should allow more of a connection between orgs and users to understand how their data is being used once it's downloaded. So as Kasha mentioned, there is uh, in various implementations the opportunity to have a survey and try to connect more to those users. So feel free again to reach out to um, Javier Tehran, who's on the call, and his team, they are the team behind HDX, and they can share more about how to gain more insight into how your data is being downloaded and used. I also see a question about data gaps, and just again, in the interest of time, we'll drop a link into the chat for the data grids overview page on HDX, where you can see the data grids for a wide range of countries that show what data is available and what data is missing, including for the countries that are mentioned in your question. We have a few more questions from the audience, and then we will shift sort of toward our final round from the fellows to hear their, their final reflection. So a really interesting question, Murray, hopefully you saw it in the chat because I didn't uh, give you fair warning, but um, someone who has done their homework sees in the bio note that you have a master's in Buddhist studies. Is there anything that Buddhism teaches us about communication today? And I might add in the humanitarian sector, possibly. Yeah, listen, that's a really good question. Um, uh, um, look, I think to, what do they say? Um, the, the, the art of genius is, is focus. And I think, you know, just, just personally, one of the impacts of the, you know, current inf information um, environment is, is that we're, we're all kind of uh, distracted all the time. So in this sense, I guess certain forms of Buddhist meditation um, uh, can strengthen focus and repair some of the fragmentation that we've all been kind of feeling. But just in terms of Buddhist philosophy, there is a great metaphor that I think kind of connects quite closely to kind of the current communications environment, that of Indra's net. It's a giant net that stretches to infin infinity and at the intersection of each bind, there's a jewel um, that reflects the light of every other jewel in the net, which is really indicative of the interconnectedness of um, all human beings. And, and honestly, I think that's a great summation of the kind of networked communications ecosystem um, that we all kind of live in. So whatever we put out, we get back. And so I guess when I think about communications, uh, it's just about being really conscious um, about the way in which we communicate, that we're designing sort of communications um, that are targeted and specific and which contribute to organizational objectives rather than just adding to this generalized kind of noise, which is, um, which is most of what we, we, we see today in, in communications. That probably didn't really answer the question. Humanitarian Buddhism, I'm sure there's a whole area there. <laughs> um, but nope. anyway, to be, to be continued. Exactly, to be continued somewhere on a mountain. So let's, uh, let's shift focus. Thank you for all of the questions in the chat. We've tried to address as many of them as we can, but I always like to end the showcase, giving the fellows a chance to reflect on one thing that surprised them, and then one recommendation they have for us moving forward in terms of how we can continue to build and improve this program and possibly focus future fellowships in the next year of this data fellows program. So we'll go uh, around the order that we did the presentations in. So Julia, Roberta, Murray, and then Kasha, and then we'll be wrapping up. So Julia, over to you. What's one thing in the course of your fellowship, either specific to your project or more generally interacting with the center and our partners that surprised you? And then related to that or not, What's one area that you think we could focus a future fellowship on or an area we could improve the program in? And so, um, well, the first thing is it, the fellowship went by so quickly and that was the first surprise. Second is I've always wanted to work on a, uh, something uh, related to climate change. But once I actually start working on it, I realize how complicated this topic is. Uh, firstly, is just because there's so many problems and they kind of multiply. Uh, and the secondly is, uh, even though there are many data sets, sometimes there's not a very direct link uh, between a problem and climate change, especially for the longer term, slower onset effect, uh, effects. So qualitatively, it's really obvious that climate change is triggering or aggravating certain problems. But when you look at the data, sometimes it's just not a very direct link. 
So that's something that I found very, that was a bit difficult while working on this topic. And I do think more uh, data sets hopefully can be developed that specifically look at this, though I feel like that might be difficult. And in terms of um, a potential uh, idea for a fellowship, I have a couple ideas, uh, both still uh, re with respect to climate change. Uh, one is, uh, I feel like if I had more time, it would have been interesting to do some spatial analysis because there's so many factors and problems related to climate change. And I feel like looking at spatial patterns could lead to some interesting insights. And the second is I think uh, for humanitarians, it might be interesting to do some projections such as looking, projecting how many people might be uh, in food insecurity, uh, dis how many displaced people there will be, or how many people that are will be in need of assistance due to climate change based on different scenarios. So I think those could be interesting topics. Great. We will Great. definitely take note of that, Julia. Roberto, over to you. Yes, thanks, Kirit. Um, I think for me, the most surprising thing was really the uh, amount of domain knowledge that's required in the sector to engage in pretty much anything, anything modeling related or, uh, or data analysis related. Uh, so I, I come from something which is more in that sense, closer to data science, where you just like know some tool and in a couple of days, you learn how to apply that to a problem. And here there's a lot of challenges in terms of knowing the specific context you're talking about, or you're trying to model, but also knowing the practical challenges that the system sort of moves within and. Um, yeah, all the pragmatics around it. So I think that was really the most surprising thing, which also speaks in, like, in favor of the idea that it's really important to have people that can sort of bridge both types of ex expertise in the sector. So give people the option to develop both on the technical side, but also in terms of domain expertise, really. Um, and uh, concerning ideas for uh, comic fellowships, I also have a few. I think I'll focus on one mostly, which is also something we've uh, briefly touched upon with Kasha in some of our conversations. And that's the idea of trying to sort of trying to make um, modeling more accessible for humanitarians, both as a sort of general uh, literacy project, but also to improve collaborations between different types of actors. But also, I think there's an important point for me to help sort of integrating the modeling part of the work with the data resources that are really available. Because that was really sort of the main bottleneck for me was uh, understanding how to bridge this gap between resources that are publicly available and the kind of things that modelers need to develop their models. So uh, working along those lines could be an interesting avenue in my opinion. Great, I see a future predictive analytics fellow digging into that. Murray, over to you. Yeah, well, you know, I've spent year, uh, 10, 10 years or so in the humanitarian sector. So, um, and, and I, I guess I felt that um, one of the surprises was just how data driven the humanitarian sector is or maybe has become. Um, I've primarily worked at headquarter um, offices and not necessarily so much in the field. So, um, I, I, I guess this, this fellowship just really kind of hammered home the um, sheer amount of data and the sheer amount of sensitive data that's being collected from recipients of aid. Aid and that kind of really drove home the importance of institutionalizing sort of um, data responsibility, not and not just in OCHA, but but really um, across the humanitarian humanitarian system. I mean, to coin a phrase, we're not responsible with data until we're all responsible with data. Um, but you know, I, I guess an area of future uh, focus for a fellowship, and, and it's not very clearly defined, but. Um, you know, often in, in 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 communications, we look at kind of trying to focus on like what was what is the impact of what we're doing? How can we communicate the impact of what we're doing? And I know Stuart and I were looking a little bit at some of the impact stories that um, uh, the centre has produced. But I think um, you know an analysis of the impact of data on the humanitarian system, and in particular data access through HDX, the humanitarian data exchange, um, I think would be important. Um, and I think it. More can be done maybe to really define how data is being used and how consolidated data sets are, are driving more effective action. So those would be my suggestions. A simple challenge that Murray has thrown down for us to tackle. Thank you so much for that, Murray. Kasha, round us out here. Sure, I'll make it quick. Uh, I know it's the end of the hour. So the thing I found most shocking, I looked at a lot of data, was the conversion rate. So people who come to the site, one in three who search will download something. In industry, if you get one in a hundred people to click something, 
that's worth celebration. So I think to me that highlighted that people really need this data. They'll make it work somehow. Whatever you have, they will make it work. And there's just a lot of perseverance, grit, and kind of creativity. So it's very humbling as someone who's coming from industry because there's kind of a plethora of choice in industry. And so as a product manager, I'm used to optimizing products to win against competition. And here it's a different game. It's about making it better because people are going to use it anyway. Um, so that's kind of the thing that stood out to me. Um, in terms of recommended areas to focus on, I think I'm going to be kind of a broken record. I, I agree uh, violently with my, my other fellows here. Um, the two that I wanted to call out was kind of like, what does quality mean in a data set? And I think I was supposed to focus on that initially, but uh, it's so challenging because to Roberta's point, you have to build domain knowledge as a foundation to even start to understand that question. And there just was not enough time to Julia's point about that. So that would be one, one thing that you could dig into, but you'd need someone who already has domain expertise. And the second thing um, is very similar to what Murray and Roberta also said, which is how to understand the impact of the data on HDX beyond just a download. So by impact, I mean, what do people do with it? Are they able to model with it? Is it the right structure and format in order for them to do something? How did it actually have an impact in the real world? I think to me, that piece of the puzzle is missing when we look at HDX, which is that we understand that people came and took stuff, but we don't actually know what it eventually uh, impacted. So those are the two that I would call out. Brilliant. That gives me an easy job for next year. So thank all of you for those ideas. And uh, really thank you to everybody who joined us. I think like trust being reciprocal, so too is community and the interest in this program and the continued engagement of our broader network with the fellows projects really shows what a strong community we are fortunate to have here at the Center for Humanitarian Data. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for your interest in the projects that the fellows shared and also in the continued work that we can do together in the I Love Data Club. I think that's what I'm gonna take out of here. If you're not part of the club, join us. We wanna hear from you, please continue engaging. And if you're interested in being a fellow in the future, watch this space for the next call for applications. Julia, Roberta, Murray, and Kasha, thank you so much for your work this summer. It has been an absolute pleasure working with you. And we know that this is just the beginning of our relationships with all of you moving forward. So everybody take care. Thank you for your interest. And we look forward to connecting again soon. Ciao.